Our sermon text. Our sermon text this morning will be Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life, is not life more than food and a body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory would not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow was thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we would ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our rock, our Lord, and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As I said last week, we are taking a few uh, week break from the book of Ecclesiastes, having finished through chapter 8. Next week, we will begin an Advent series, Come Thou Long Expect the Jesus, where we will look at a certain prophetic text speaking of the coming Christ, who he is to be, and what he has come to do. And so that left this Sunday as a sort of one-off situation. And this is a wonderful day of the church year. We're coming up on Thanksgiving holiday. It is the last Sunday before Advent. More recently, some churches have celebrated the Sunday before Advent as Christ the King Sunday, focusing on the universal lordship and kingship of Jesus Christ over all of time and all of the world. And as I looked at certain texts, I was struck by this one. It is a great text to consider as we, uh, as we prepare ourselves to give thanks for God's care, for God's provision, for all of God's gifts. It is, a, it is a text that speaks about the king and his kingdom. But I was also struck, as I began thinking about this text, of its similarities to the theme of what we have been uh, discussing in the book of Ecclesiastes. This passage is stuck right in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And if you have ever done a study of the Sermon on the Mount, you will know that it's very closely associated with Moses in the giving of the law in Mount Sinai. Jesus, the light Moses, Jesus, the new Moses, goes up on a mountain and he gives the law to his disciples. He gathers around him the new elders of the church, just like Moses took up 70 elders on the Mount Sinai. Jesus gathers the new elders of the new Israel, and he gives them a new law. Or really what he does is he deepens and he applies the law of Moses. He says it's not enough that you simply avoid murdering, but you really cannot even insult or hate your brother. It is not enough for you to avoid the physical act of adultery, but you cannot even look upon a woman with lust. Jesus says, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But here in this passage, I think Jesus is assuming another role. Jesus is the new Solomon. He gives us a hint at this when he, when he describes Solomon's glory in verse 29. But Jesus here is giving us new wisdom literature. He seems to be drawing on both Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. 
Like the new Solomon, like Solomon in Proverbs, Jesus points to the natural world and tells us to learn lessons from the natural world about God and our responsibilities toward God. Solomon says, observe the ant and learn from its ways. Jesus says, go to the birds and to the flowers and observe their ways. Going back to verse 19, Jesus, like Solomon, presents two paths, two ways, the path of frustration and foolishness and the path of wisdom. Like Solomon in Ecclesiastes, Jesus is pointing out that we do not control our lives and so we must live by faith. But just like Jesus pushes Moses' law further and deeper into the heart, so Jesus also pushes Solomon's wisdom deeper and further into the heart. He describes the frustration and the worry and the anxiety when we look around at a world we do not control, and he points us not only to the fact that God is sovereign over all things, like Solomon did, but Jesus also points out that the God who is sovereign over all things is your Father. That the God who is sovereign over all things is the God who also loves you and knows and understands your needs and provides for those needs. And so when our passage begins, Jesus gives a command. Do not be anxious about your life. And we... Some people have described the age in which we live as an anxious age. Anxiety seems to impress itself upon all aspects of its life, both individually and even on society as a whole. It seems to, to just be part of the ocean that we swim in is an ocean of anxiety. But what exactly is it? Oftentimes, when talking to people about this, I describe anxiety as a generalized fear. I think when we talk about fear, we talk about something with a very specific object or event in mind. I am fearful of the event of death. I am fearful of the dark when I turn off the lights at night. I am fearful of needing to confront or have a conversation with this person. But anxiety and worry, on the other hand, seem to be much more general. And we worry about the future. We worry about potential problems. We worry about finances. We are anxious about our children's future. We are anxious about losing a loved one. We are anxious about the possibility of getting sick. If we connect this to what we have been seeing in the book of Ecclesiastes, I think anxiety comes from recognizing the truth of what Solomon says when he looks around and observes life under the sun. Solomon looks around, he concludes that everything, including our own lives, is a myth, it's a vapor, we cannot control any of it. But when we look into the future, we realize not only do we have no clue what's going to happen, but we also have no control over the things that will come at us. And so when we face this reality that we do not know and we cannot control, we begin to fear. We begin to worry. We begin to become anxious. Worry creeps into our mind. The question of what if constantly occupies us, right? What if Russia decides to go nuclear? What if the economy tanks? What if my children get sick? What if I lose my job? What if, what if, what if? And Jesus goes on to give us very specific examples of the kind of things that we become anxious about. Do not be anxious about what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about the body, the clothes that you will put on. And these are very specific things that we can be and often are anxious about. I think for us, the reality that lies behind these kinds of questions is the questions of money and finances. We need money for food and drink and clothes. Where is that going to come from? Therefore, finances and money become our constant source of anxiety. But notice one thing about this list, and in fact, Jesus points, points it out at the end, that these are things that we need. Right? We need food and drink and clothes. These are not frivolous things that we can simply do without. They are absolute necessity for our life. 
But here's the point that God has created us to need these things. That God has designed the human person to be a needy creature. That we have physical, that we have spiritual, that we have psychological needs. That we are not a self-contained person who can exist without taking in things that we need from outside of ourselves. Our worry comes when we consider the possibility of a circumstance in which our needs are not met. We worry that something will happen in which our, our, our physical needs or, or our physical comfort or our physical safety will not be met. We worry that something will happen that will leave us emotionally devastated, that we will lose someone or something that we love. And so this is to point out that the, according to human logic, the logic of worry really makes a lot of sense. We are very needy creatures, and we also know that we do not have the ability to meet those own needs. We look into the future and we consider a possibility that there will come a time in which we do not have access to the things that we need. And so Jesus' first answer is a rhetorical question. Is, life, is not life more than food or the body more than clothing? He says, is there not more to life than simply striving to fulfill your appetites? Is there not more than life than simply concerning about outward appearance, getting at the fact that you were created in the image of God, you were created to live in a relationship for, with God? Isn't life much more than about food and drink and clothing and finances? Now, here's the problem at this point in the passage. Everything that Jesus says is true, but it doesn't work. All right? Here's what I mean. Have you ever found yourself worrying or anxious, talking to someone who is worrying and anxious? They say to you, and you say to them, hey, I have an idea of what you can do about your anxiety. Just stop worrying. Right? Just stop worrying. Stop your anxiety. They would probably look at you and say, don't you think I thought of that? Years ago, the great comedian Bob Newhart had a classic skit with this premise. He's a counselor. A woman comes into her to discuss all of her anxiety, all of her worry. And after listening compassionately, after asking her a few questions, he starts yelling at her, stop it. Stop your worrying. Stop your anxiety. And it's a funny skit because that never works. If someone could just stop worrying, then they would. And Jesus knows this, and because he knows this, he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just tell us, don't worry, stop your worrying, stop it. But he goes on to say the way in which we stop it, the thing that we replace our anxiety and our worry with. He gives us the antidote to worrying, not just telling us simply to stop. And he tells us that the antidote to worry is trusting in the Father, which is the only thing that can erase our anxiousness. And Jesus tells us first, he says, look at the birds of the air. They neither reap nor sow nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they are? Consider the lilies of the field. Consider how they grow. Consider how they don't spend all their time making beautiful garments for themselves, but their beauty far surpasses Solomon in his most glorious, beautiful, rich robe. Now, there are, I think there are all sorts of things that we can point out here. Think about God's care for his creatures. Birds flying around in the air do not struggle with worry and anxiety. Birds do not toil at finding an advantage or some gain in life. And yet, despite not worrying at all, God still takes care of them. The flowers of the field don't work to make them beaut themselves beautiful, but yet God has given them beauty that surpasses King Solomon at the height of his and Israel's glory. But also no note that one of the things that Jesus does here is he points away from worrying about some potential problem in the future, and he tells us to consider, to meditate on, the concrete moment and the concrete world that God has created that you exist in at this moment. 
One commentator that I read on this passage struck me when he began his commentary on this passage by asking, has it ever struck you what a basically happy person Jesus was? Right? That, that struck me. Has it ever struck you what a basic happy person Jesus was? Yes, we know of his sorrow. We, we know of his grief. But the commentator says these are just dark patches that are painted upon a bright background. To understand what Jesus is doing here is he's talking about his own experience. He is talking about how he lived his life. Jesus would give to watch birds frolic around in the air. Jesus would stop and watch the spring wildflowers as they erupted over the Galilean hills. Unhappy people do not stop and watch the birds. Anxious people don't stop and smell the flowers. Jesus was a man who observed the concrete beauty that overflowed in the world around him, and he knew as a wise man what lesson to take from that beauty. Yes, this world is an uncontrollable vapor, as we've seen in Ecclesiastes, but we should also recognize that that vapor is shot through with beauty. That the vapor of our world is shot completely through with beauty. Beautiful moments, beautiful scene, beautiful relationships. And our beauty and our anxiety, our worry, makes us miss all of this beauty that God has put into our world. It makes us miss what these beautiful things have to teach us about God and his world. God is the author of all of this beauty. He is the author of every beautiful passing moment that we have. He is the creator of the soaring bird, the circling fish, the sea of flowers. He is the one who creates, controls, and cares for everything in the world. Why then should we worry? And Jesus asked the question, which one of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your life what good does anxiety and worry gain for you what control does it give you over anything worrying about the bad things that might happen in the future will never stop them from happening you have plenty to attend to today and so instead of worrying about all the potential future problems that you cannot control take pleasure and joy in the beauty that God has given to you. Take joy in your spouse's embrace and your child's laugh. Take joy in the work that God has given you to do. Take joy in the food and the drink that is on your table, as great and wonderful as it may be, or as meager as they can be. And some people throughout history have kind of taken and misused Jesus' word to meaning that we are not to reap, that we are not to sow, that we are not to spin, that we are not to toil. That, that uh, uh, living by faith means that we do not think about or work for the future at all. But of course this is false. Jesus' point is that we don't, not that we don't do these things, but that we don't do them anxiously. We don't do them with worry. That we go to work, we plan for the future, we sow and we reap, we spin in the toil, in toil with joy. We do these things with Faith. We do these things in hope that God will bless them. Because God wants to feed and clothe us, not because we are anxious that he won't. God has created us many creatures, and God wants to take care of us. And so he says, consider the lesson of nature. God cares so much to create and sustain birds and bees and even mosquitoes. God is the God who causes the grass to spring the grass to spring to life every spring. Won't he also take care of you? And Jesus says, O oh, you of little faith. The great reformed preacher Martin Lloyd Martin Lloyd Jones comments on this passage, this question, O oh, you of little faith. He said he once heard someone say, that the problem with many Christians is that, yes, we believe on Jesus, but that we do not believe him. What this person means is that we believe on God for salvation. We trust that he has provided everything we need to get saved, to go to heaven, but that we do not believe that Jesus will take care of us in this life. 
We don't believe Jesus when he says, I am going to look out for you. I am going to provide for you. I love you and I care for you. Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy burdened and I will give you rest. And yet we'd rather keep our burden. We'd rather keep our worries. We'd rather keep our anxiety to ourselves. We operate with an inbuilt assumption that Jesus will take care of the spiritual thing, that Jesus can rescue us from hell, but that we take care of everything else, that everything else is our responsibility, our worry. Again, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon points out to the fact of God's sovereignty, God's control over everything as the basis of our need to trust him with all the things in life we do not control. And Jesus pushes it further. The sovereign God is your father. God is not only sovereign, but God is good. God is not only sovereign, but God is loving. God is not only sovereign, but he is the father who cares for his children, who cares for you, who knows what you need. Will he not provide for his own children? And just a few verses, if you keep reading in chapter 7, Jesus again presses this point. If sinful, evil human father know how to provide good gifts, knows how to provide bread and sustenance for his children, how much more will your heavenly father, who cares about you, then provide everything that you need? And so we must learn what it means to live by faith and not just learn what it means to live with faith. That we not just have faith be a part of our life, no matter how big it is, but rather to live every day trusting that we are in our Heavenly Father's loving hands. To live every day knowing that God is constantly giving and providing for us. To live every day knowing that everything that we have is a gift that God stoops down to put into our hands. That every moment of fleeting beauty, every moment of joy that we experience was designed and given from our Heavenly Father to you. And so we must live in faith. We must walk by faith and not just live having faith, be a part of our life, trusting God to save us, trusting God to rescue us from hell and doing the rest of life on our own. Jesus tells us in verse 33, then, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. As we pivot next week to the season of Advent, we remember that John the Baptist came preparing the kingdom, and Jesus came proclaiming and announcing the kingdom. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, we shouldn't think of it so much as a realm, a place, but rather the, the announcement of the kingdom of God is an announcement that there is a king, that the king has now come, that the king has come to bring his reign and his rule to bear upon the earth. Jesus comes preaching the kingdom because Jesus is the king who says the kingdom of heaven had now arrived because the king has come. The kingdom come and he brings this new kingdom that exists right in the midst of the world with all the old kingdoms. The old kingdoms are kingdoms of anxiety and worry and striving. And the new kingdom that Jesus comes is a kingdom in which we love and trust and believe in and walk in step with the king. The new heavenly king, God himself, is coming to bring justice, coming to bring his way of life to bear upon those who would belong to and be citizens of the kingdom. And being citizens of the kingdom, we must learn what it means to live in submission to the king, seeking out how to know the king, seeking out how to walk in step and be obedient to the king, to live according to his righteousness and what this king commands. If that is our priority, living in step with the king, then Jesus says, all of these things that you worry about will be added to you. Having your desires, having your priorities ordered rightly to the up, down into the midst of your heart is of utmost importance. Many people, in desiring or seeking something else, end up losing the very thing they desire. People put wealth as their primary desire, and so they make all kinds of risky and foolish decisions, and they lose it all. 
People seek first respectability and honor, and in doing so, they act in all kinds of ways that make them lose all respectability. People put their health first, and so they end up stressing about the health, and all that stress and worry have a negative effect on their health. People worry about their children, and so we begin to helicopter parent our children, never allowing our children to grow up to understand consequences and being wise to make their own decisions. And so we must seek first the kingdom of God. We must seek first the king, and everything else is added to us once those desires are ordered. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, Jesus says. Each day has its own problems. Let tomorrow take care of itself. But when we do come to tomorrow, when we come to that day that we are worried about, what we will find when we are, arrive on that day is that everything that we have talked about is true with then as well. When tomorrow comes, God, your Father, will continue to love you. When tomorrow comes, you will find that God cares for you and God provides for you. When tomorrow comes, you will find that Jesus is still on his throne and that his kingdom and his righteousness matters above all. And so the proper response to each day is not to worry about the future. The proper response to each day is rather gratitude and thankfulness. Taking each day as it comes in all of its vapor, in all of its beautiful moments, and receiving everything as gift from the Father, teaching us to love him and trust in his care. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks that Jesus the King has come, bringing his righteousness. And Father, we do pray that you would form us to be a people who seek that first. Father, we pray that you would make us thankful. We pray that we would repent and turn from our anxiety and our worry, and that we would trust and hope in you alone. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.